Okay, so peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Oh, if I'm going to read this, I'm going to have to take my glasses off. <laughs> so now I can't see your reactions. That might be better, actually. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having me and for showing up here today, all of you. Uh, it was quite a shock to get invited to England. I really had very little idea that, you know, that anybody knew me here. And probably many of you don't know me. So I thought this first talk would be sort of an introductory talk, where I explain why I'm here, how I got here, so to speak, and then, uh, and then we'll just you know, have some question and answers. Many of the issues that I'm going to raise today during this talk, I'll talk more about in the coming days. So this is sort of like, uh, uh, you know, ascending off. So uh, is that all right? <laughs> so I, I begin this talk by talking about how it is I became a Muslim. And then if time permits, uh, then I'll talk about the difficulties encountered after becoming a Muslim, especially with regard to fitting into the mosque culture in America. So, how did I become a Muslim? I remember when, uh, you know, I did become a Muslim, I often would go to uh, websites or read pamphlets put out by Muslims and they would claim that I converted from Christianity to Islam. And I did not convert from Christianity to Islam. I converted from atheism to Islam. I did not believe in God. Can you so I used to leave the door of my office at the University of San Francisco unlocked because I knew I would eventually lose my keys. So I left it unlocked so I could get in and out of there without having to keep going down to the main office and asking them to make a new key. So, one, so students would leave books in there, assignments, things like that. So one day I walked down to the, my office. I walk into my office. The door, of course, is open. I go in there. And I see a green text sitting on the middle of my desk. And I assumed a student left a book there. And I walk over to it, and I look at it, and on the cover of it, it says, the Holy Quran, an English interpretation. And I look at it, and I thought, who left that there? Immediately, I knew who, who must have left it, that there. It must have been my family, my adopted Muslim family. And then I thought, what are they trying to say by this? I thought they said they didn't want to talk about religion anymore. Now they're leaving a copy of the Quran on my desk? Are they trying to convert me? I mean, God, I mean, they're not even religious people, you know. My mom took me to bars and discos. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they're saying if I don't become a Muslim, they're not, our friendship can't continue. You know, all these, I'm a very sort of s skeptical person, pessimistic. I always assume the worst to begin with. But then as I thought about it more, I realized this was like a peace offering. They, I could see in their faces they were embarrassed when they said they, or indicated they didn't want to talk about religion anymore. I thought this was a way of sort of smoothing things out. Jeff, we don't want to talk about it, but if you really are interested in our religion, here's a copy of the Quran, it's our scripture. I knew it was their scripture anyway from other conversations. So I took it as a peace offering. And I didn't even bring the subject up again. I put it on my shelf, actually I put it on my coffee table in my apartment in Diamond Heights in San Francisco. I left it there. And then a couple of weeks passed, and I, uh, you know, when I was a grad student at Purdue University, I shipped all my books by the cheapest method possible to my office in San Francisco, and none of them had arrived yet. See, the only books I had with me were the ones I brought in the U-Haul in the moving van from California, uh, from Indiana, that I drove out to California with, and there was only like 20. So in no time at all, I had run out of things to read. So I had nothing to read this night. I looked at the magazines. I had already read them twice. I turned on the TV. It was Johnny Carson. So boring. I turned it off. So do you know who Johnny Carson is? <laughs> oh, all right. So now I'm sitting in my, I'm sitting in my uh, apartment and nothing to read. And I'm looking around. And I look over. And there on my table, side table, is an English interpretation of the Holy Quran. So I pick it up and think, why not? I'll read a few pages, I'll get bored, I'll put it down, 
you know, maybe lucky, hopefully it'll bore me to the extent that I'll go to sleep. No, I mean, seriously, I, didn't, I wasn't expecting much, you know. Although, you know, some script, scriptures I had read were very beautiful, I had beautiful stories. So I thought, you know, maybe the stories, the myths, etc., will be interesting. So I pick it up, I pick it up, I want to get through this part, next 10 minutes. I pick it up, I am boring, you know, am I not? <laughs> yeah. It's like when I teach mathematics, you know, I, I'm really into it, and then I look at my students, and I'm getting all excited, and I turn to my class, and they're all like, you know, they're like, can we leave now? <laughs> I, I pick it up. And I look at the first surah, I turn to the first surah, and I'm just reading it out of academic curiosity. And, and it's, it's obviously a, a hymn of praise to me. It's like a psalm for those of you who know the Bible. At least it starts that way. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, all praise be to God, ruler of all worlds, uh, master of the king or master of the day of judgment. Actually, the day of requital, the day of recompense, the day when counts are settled. Uh, to you alone, and then it goes on from there. And I'm reading it, and I'm thinking, oh, a hymn of praise, a song. And I get to the end of it, and then as I get to the end of it, I realize, oh, the last few lines slipped into, made the subtle transition into a prayer for guidance. Show us the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not those who have gone astray, or upon whom is violence or wrath. And I thought, what a clever author. You know, he tricked me into making a prayer for guidance, a supplication for guidance. Clever man. So I assume the course, I assume the Quran had a human author. So I turn to the next surah, and it begins Aleph, Lam, Mim, three Arabic letters. Then that is the book we're in no doubt, is the guidance for those who are on their toes or vigilant. So I read it and I look at it and say, so are you talking to me? <laughs> are you saying that this prayer for guidance that I just inadvertently made, you're now saying that this is the guidance that I was seeking? And I look at the opening line and again and it says, that is the book. And I thought, the author has a very interesting style. See, from this point in the Quran, the beginning of the second surah, from here on out, the perspective is God addressing the reader. God speaking to the reader. I always thought, you know, scripture should be like the ones I was exposed to. Stories, ancient history, story, a biography of a prophet or something. This is direct, God talking to the reader, addressing the reader. I thought, now this, the author of this book, definitely was original. <laughs> he, he actually wrote a revelation from God to humanity, which is what you would think a revelation would be. But not only that, he has a very engaging style. He, he gets you to ask questions, and then, get, then gives answers, and then creates more questions. Somehow, this Quran, he wrote in a style that gets you into a dialogue with the, the scripture. Like that just brief dialogue I just mentioned. I'd have that experience repeatedly as I read through the Quran. This dialogue, I'd find myself drawn in. I'd ask a question. A few lines later, sometimes a couple passages later, maybe I would see an answer. And then I would create another question. And then I was involved in this veritable dialogue with the scripture. So... <laughs> Okay, I have to stop in four minutes and give the taper a break. So, uh, so I keep on reading the Quran. I think that I'm impressed by the author's original and ingenious style. And then the next several verses, uh, the next several passages, uh, summarize the Quran's major themes. Talks about who get, could be guided by the scripture, who can't, sort of the prerequisites for getting guided. I thought that's very clever, so, sort of same way we write math text. And then I come, of course, to the famous allegory, which you would expect after you get through an introduction. The Quran is going to talk about Homo sapiens, human beings, and their origin and what their life is all about. And the famous allegory of the first man and first woman. So that begins in the 30th verse of the second surah. Should I stop here? And, 
Okay. We just have to give him one minute to switch. So, I've come to the 30th verse of the Quran. Now, up till now, I am impressed with the author's style, but I'm only 30, what, 36 verses into the Quran? I'm not so impressed and I'm captivated by the scripture. But I come to the 30th verse and it begins, Behold, your Lord said to the angels. Behold, your Lord said to the angels. So we're about to hear a heavenly announcement, a heavenly election, a great moment. So, this great election. Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I'm going to put a vicegerent of mine on earth, a viceroy, an emissary, a representative of mine. This is a noble election. God is about to create man and assign him a noble role. I immediately said to myself, no, he, he obviously got the story all wrong. Man is not put on earth to fill some noble role. He's put on earth as a punishment. Because that's, in my religious tradition, the one of my birth, the one I abandoned, and I'm not putting it down, but that's the way the story is told. And I felt the author got confused when he was, you know, repeating the story. I mean, this was my perspective. Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I am about to put a vicegerent of mine on earth. And then the angels said, and the angels said, will you put therein one who will spread corruption? and shed much blood while we the angels celebrate your praises and glorify you glorify your holy name and I read that verse and I just stared at it I couldn't I was captivated I was angry I could feel the heat rising inside me because look what it says will you put there in one God says, I'm going to put, assign these humans this noble role. And then, God, and then the angels say, are you going to create this being who spreads corruption and sheds much blood? This most criminal, violent, destructive creature? And put him on earth in this role? When you could create us, as they plainly say, while we celebrate your praises and glorify you? How could you create this and assign him that role when we are clearly more, more deserving and more appropriate? Are you following me? And that was my question. That was my life. That was my childhood. All of it just encapsulated in those 15 words. And I was shocked. I thought the author is committing theological suicide. You don't ask the most poignant question in the history of man's theological reflections. A question for which there is no rational answer. In the beginning of the story of the first man and woman. At least wait to the end of the scripture. <laughs> but don't put it from the start. I had to find out how he answered the question, as, as disturbing as I thought the question was, how it brought back all my childhood, I had to find out. And so I was hooked. I wanted to see how the author answered that question. So I began reading through the Quran, and I immediately got some hints, but it didn't fill in the picture. So I kept reading and reading and reading. And to tell you the truth, and this is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, at tomorrow's lecture, for the youth, for the people who consider themselves youth. By the time I had finished the Quran, all the arguments I had against the existence of God, all the premises I had built against his existence, one by one, I saw them falling apart. So by the time I finished the Quran, I had no more argument against the existence of God. But not having an argument against God is not the same as having a reason to believe in Him. Once my daughter Jamila asked me, Daddy, I understood. You know, we could go on walk after walk after walk and we discuss these things. I understood how you found in the Quran answers to all your objections to the existence of God. But what made you believe in God? Yeah, she's a very bright girl. Because she understood. Not having an argument against is not the same as having a reason to believe. And I told her, honey, 
It's hard for me to explain, but as I was reading, as best as I understand it, as I was reading through the Quran, and one by one, the sort of fortress of the wall I had built between myself and the belief in the existence of God, as that wall began to crumble, one by one, piece by piece, as those arguments faded away, I began to have slight doubts about my atheism. And the more I began to doubt my atheism, the more the power of the Quran began to affect me. And the Quran is written in a very interesting style. In the, begin, in the beginning, it's, very, it's quite technical. It goes into a lot of specifics, laws and rules and regulations. By the middle, it takes you into stories, beautiful stories, and powerful allegories. Towards the end, the emotions of the Quran picks up and it like reaches a crescendo and brings it all to this beautiful, powerful bursts of spirituality and eschatology and it all comes together in brilliant, pounding images. And by the time I was getting towards the end of the Quran as my atheism began to fade away, I began having these powerful spiritual moments when I felt I was in the presence of this tremendous divine embrace. I remember w reading the surah, Wa duha wa layli idha saja ma wa dahka rabbuka, you know. When I got to the end of that surah, I cried like a baby for 20 minutes. I didn't even believe in God. And it brought me to tears. And, uh, you know, I would try to deny these experiences as I was having them. I would try to step on them. They kept on, they just kept coming. And, I, and it was whittling away at my atheism. So by the time I was finished with the Quran, I had severe doubts about the non-existence of God. So I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. So I figured, I have four more minutes. So I, I was, you know, weeks. Oh yeah, you changed it, sorry. Weeks were passing now, and I just wanted this experience that I had of reading the Quran to go away. I couldn't sleep sometimes. When I would walk to work, I would think about it. When I was sitting at work, it would keep coming back to me. The questions it raised, the issues, the power it had over me. I mean, I was an atheist. I shouldn't be having these experiences. I needed to talk to somebody. And I couldn't talk to the family that had, had been Adop that adopted me because they didn't have, it was clear they didn't have much knowledge of religion. So I thought I would go, I heard there was a mosque on campus and I thought I would go there and a Jewish student, a female Jewish student, a good friend of mine, pointed it out to me. She's, we were walking by the church one day, St. Ignatius Church, this big beautiful spiraling church. And we were walking by the rear of it and she pointed to the basement and said, you see that basement door down there, down that stairway. I looked down, long stairway, down to the basement beneath the church. She said, that's where the Muslim students pray. She said, I heard they have carcasses down there. You know, dead bodies. <laughs> so, <laughs> I said, but this was long before. But now I remembered her saying that. And I thought, I would go to the place where the Muslim students pray and asked him the questions. I didn't want, I wasn't going to become a Muslim, and that's out of the question. But I thought maybe they could help say something that I could form my own kind of personal religion or something like that, or, you know, or personal philosophy that could soothe me and get this out of my system. So in any case, so I walk over to the church one morning, now I told myself I was going to go, Sunday I told myself I was going to go the next day. But I had already done what I, now it was Wednesday, and I thought I would try one more time to get up the courage to go. So I stood out in front of Harney Science Center, and you just, you walk across the parking lot, and there's the church. Harney Science Center, where I have my office. And I'm looking, and I'm staring at the mosque, and it was a day like today in Manchester. It was kind of cloudy but the sun was starting to break through. So I finally said, Jeff, come on, just do it. So I marched over. And I get with my head down, and I come to the, the stairways down in to the church, to the basement. And I start to get nervous. 
sick to my stomach. No, no, wait a minute, I'm not going to. <laughs> no, let me, let me just go check to make sure that's the place where the Muslims really pray. I don't want to be. So I look around the church looking for any other more likely entrance because it's really a humbling entrance. I mean, it's in a dark basement. It's, the stairs, stairway is dark. There's mold on the side of the wall. It couldn't be that. So I went around looking for other entrances to the mosque. There's nothing. So I went inside the church. I thought I'd go inside there and ask. Somebody might know. So I went inside the church, and the only person there was a janitor. And I went up to him and said, uh, and I looked really nervous, uh, could you tell me where the mosque is? And he looked at me like he was going to hit me with the broom. And he, he looked at me like, are you nuts? I didn't even think he knew there was a mosque there. I quickly just walked out of the church stood in the, now the sun was breaking. I felt such a relief to be outside. And then I thought, I'll just go try that stairway down beneath the church in the basement underground. So I went and walked over, stood there looking at it. I stood there for about five seconds. And then finally I said, okay, let's go. So I start walking down the stairs. Every foot closer, every step closer, the more weak my knees got. I walked seven miles a day. Back in those days, I actually used to run 10, 10 kilometers to 10 miles a day. I had very strong legs. They were shaking by the time I got to the doorway. I reached out to grab the door, my hand was shaking. I, said, I turned around, <laughs> I was in a panic. I turned around, I, I rushed to the top of the stairs, stood there, and I thought to myself, Jeff, are you an idiot? You go in and out of doors every day at this university. Get a grip. At most, there's nobody there or there's students down there. What's on the stairs? I turn around, head back down the stairs. Same experience. My knees are getting weaker. I try to reach the door. My hand's sweating now. It's shaking. My head's... I couldn't do it. I turn around again. I walk quickly back up the stairs, catch my breath. Take some deep breaths. And then finally, I said to myself, I'll never get down those stairs. So I looked up to the heavens. I don't know why we human beings do this, but we often do this in this sort of situation. I looked up to the heavens, and it was majestic and beautiful. The clouds were dissipating, the sunlight was starting to shine through them. I looked up to the heavens, and I it made something I hadn't made in many years, a voluntary prayer. And I said, oh God, if you are really there, you know, because I wasn't quite sure, give me the strength to go down those stairs and go inside that door. And then I stood waiting. I was waiting for a sign. Uh, I, I would have settled for anything. You know, a bolt of lightning, a bird land on my shoulders, an earthquake. San Francisco, we have earthquakes all the time. <laughs> you know, I, I would have taken it. I'm waiting for some sort of sign. What an idiot I am, but it's true. I was waiting for a sign. No sign. I turned around, walked down the stairs, put my hand on the door, pushed it open, and there were two students inside. And they looked at me and they said, can, it, can we help you? Immediately, I got nervous. And I started calling out names of Muslims I knew. Uh, is Mahmoud or Omar or Siraj here? They looked at me, again, like the janitor upstairs. No, nobody by that name here. What's their, what's their family name? I said, uh, Gandil? You don't know them. Of course not, they never go to the mosque. So I said, thank you for your time. I'm sorry, I must be in the wrong place. I turned around to walk away, and then the, one of the students, who happened to be from Malaysia, and he was wearing traditional Malaysian dress, short guy, Abdul Hanan, I'd find out his name later. He said to me, would you like to learn about Islam? I said, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Why not? So he said, well, come on in. So I started to step in and he said, please take off your shoes, we, we pray here. I thought, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so I took off my shoes. So I walked in and I sat down. And they said, what would you like to know about Islam? I said, well, I've been reading quite a bit about it. By that time, I had not only written, 
read the Quran, I had read several other books. And they told me, uh, they started talking to me and uh, saying some things, and I couldn't relate to any of it. And then finally, Abdul Hanan said, after about three minutes into his conversation, the other student, his name was Muhammad Yusuf, he was Palestinian, and he was dressed in Western clothing. And Abdul Hanan said to me uh, something about how when the angels take your souls when you die, they beat them and strain them out of their carcasses, <laughs> yeah, torture them. I, I remember when he said that, my response was, you know, I think I gotta go. You know, I think I have an appointment in my office. <laughs> I, I didn't, but just, I thought that was just so lame. So I was ready to leave. And just then, as I'm turning, as I'm excusing myself, the door opens. And now the skies have cleared and the sun is going down. And it's going down right behind the door. So the person who opens the door gets silhouetted. This brilliant silhouette of a human form. But it's just not any human form. This fellow has a long beard and he has a turban on his head. And like granny glasses. And he has a cane. And he's wearing a thobe that comes down about calf length and sandals. I'm looking at him, and there's this biblical silhouette at the door. He looks like Moses coming out of the Sinai. And so I thought, wow, I gotta talk to this guy. So he walks inside the door, he takes off his shoes, walks inside his door, holds his hands up like this as if he's waiting for his share of something, closes his eyes and mutters something. So then he uh, puts, you know, resumes his normal posture. And then he walks over. Oh, no, he says something to Muhammad Yusuf. So this fellow also must be an Arab. Now. Says something to Muhammad Yusuf. Muhammad Yusuf. <laughs> <laughs> this brother goes. Bah, bah, bah. And he goes. Uh, prof professor. Oh. Ah. <laughs> so this brother walks over. As he's walking over, they tell me that's Brother Hassan. Brother Hassan. His name is Hassan Zara. He walks over. He's obviously some sort of big shot in the master. But he's a student. He's pretty young. He's in his mid-twenties. He walks over. He sits down next to me. Puts his hand on my leg like that. And uh, trying to get me to relax. And then he says, he could obviously see I was nervous. And then he says, what's your name? First person that asked me that. <laughs> and uh, it was a nice personal touch. Remember that when you talk to somebody about your faith. Treat them like a person. So he says, what's your name? I said, uh, Jeff Lang. And he said, what do you do here? He said, I work at the university. I'm in the mathematics department. He said, you're a professor? I said, yeah. And he looks at the other two. And then he says, uh, so you came to hear something about Islam? I said, well, sort of. And he said, uh, what would you like to know? And I told, him, I told him what I knew about the religion through reading it. And he was quite impressed. And then he started telling me something. Uh, rules and regulations, you know, one after another, one rule, another rule, another rule. Thinking, why is he giving me the rundown on the law? And then uh, it, it was going, getting very dry. So I told him, uh, well, thank you all for your time. I really appreciated it. I thought he would be more fascinating than he was, really. You know, it turns out just another student with this fancy garb on. But uh, he was a very spiritual man. But I could already sense that. But he said to me, uh, so I told him, and I meant it this time, thank you for your time, but I really got to get back to my office now. And then he said to me, uh, you have no other questions? And then I said, no. And I started to get up. And then I remembered one, just came to my mind. I said, can you tell me what it feels like to be a Muslim? I used to ask good questions. Can you tell me what it feels like to be a Muslim? I mean, how do you feel you, in your relationship to God? How do you experience it? What do you experience? And he looked at me. Turns out this guy was sort of an expert at Dawah, at talking to others about his faith. He was the head in the United States of the Tabliki Jama'at. And uh, he was one of two heads. There were two in the United States. He was one of them, even though he was a young student. 
But you could t I could tell his question caught him off guard. My question caught him off guard because he didn't know how to answer it immediately. And then he lowered his head like this and thought for a while. And then he made another supplication. He closed his eyes, muttered something to himself. And then he started his answer to my question like this. I'll never forget it. It's as if it was both a call and a prayer. He started, Allah. And then he, then he said, Allah is so merciful. And he loves us more than a mother loves, and, his, and the words he used, her baby child. He said, and yet, uh, and then he said, and, and yet we can do nothing except by the will of Allah. When we breathe in, it is by his will. And when we breathe out, it is by his will. And we take, when we take our foot off the ground to walk, to take a step, we'd never accomplish that except by Allah's will. And we, our foot would never reach the ground again except by his permission. And then he said, when a tiniest leaf falls from a tree, he wasn't even looking at me. His eyes were closed, and he was like talking to himself. When a tiniest leaf falls from the tallest tree and twists and turns on its journey to the ground, he said, no segment of that journey would take place except by Allah's command. And then he said, and when we pray and put our nose to the ground, we feel a peace, a joy, a rest, a coolness that's impossible to describe. You just have to experience it to know. And I, he got done, that was it. He looked, he looked disappointed. <laughs> like, what I just said must not make sense. He looked disappointed. But you know, when I was listening to him, how much I wish we could trade places. So I could just know that spirituality, that yearning, that agony, that ecstasy, that yearning for his Lord. But of course, I was an American, he was an Arab. You know, I was a Western, I was an atheist. Of course, it wasn't possible. And then he said to me, because now I really was going to get leave, he said to me, so would you like to become a Muslim? <laughs> I looked at him like, are you nuts? <laughs> I looked at him and said, no. I laughed. No, no, <laughs> thank you. Actually, my hands were sweating. The back of my neck was getting wet. I felt panic. I felt my whole body getting hot. But I, I laughed it off. I said, no, no, not today. I, it's not for me. I just, just came to ask some questions. And then he looked at me, you know, like he was looking through me. He said, I think you believe in this. Why don't you just try it? And when he said that, before he said that, I could see my friends laughing at me. I could see m myself trying to explain it to my mother, how I became a Muslim. I could see people uh, uh, stumbling over explanations to old friends of mine. Some of them were dead by now. But, you know, all these voices and, and, and heat rushing through my body. But when he said that, you know, I think you believe in it. Why don't you just try? Suddenly I just calmed down. I didn't feel anything anymore, just blank. And then I remembered my words my mom used to tell me. My mom used to tell me, son, if you believe in something, it had nothing to do with religion. If you believe in something and you believe it really truly in your heart, you should pursue it wherever it takes you. Even if the, all of humanity is against you. And she said that was something about, that's a very German thing. Because <laughs> my, my parents are German. But every, everybody believes it anyway. So in any case, I remembered it, and I got comforted from it. And I looked at the three, three brothers there. Now there were two more that came in. Rosley and another brother from Malaysia. And I looked at them all, all the brothers there, five now, and I told them, yeah, I, I think I'll become a Muslim. And you should have seen their faces. They looked like the Apollo engineers after the first successful moon landing. You know, they were all congratulating each other and smiling, and a couple of them were, you know, hugging each other. 
this amazing reaction. I thought that they just had become Muslims. And, uh, and just then the door opens and another brother, biblical looking brother comes in the door dressed just like Brother Hassan. He comes in, he's burly though, he looks like Burl Ives, I don't think you know who that is. Old American singer, big burly guy, sort of like Santa Claus. And uh, his name is Mustafa, and they say, Mustafa, the brother wants to become a Muslim. So Mustafa comes running over and he grabs me, give me this big, you know, the Muslim triple hug, which I had never had up until that point. To give me a hug, and then Hassan says to me, he hasn't become a Muslim yet, Mustafa. Mustafa goes like this, let's go with me. <laughs> like he uh, discovered something very precious, <laughs> fragile. So then Ghassan says to Mustafa, so tell him what to say, Mustafa. I wanted to give Mustafa the moment. So Mustafa then takes me through the Shahada very slowly. Um, a shadow, a shadow, and that, you know, he's whispering it. Can you go a little louder? I can't hear you. And then he repeats it for me in English. You know, I, I testify that there's no God but God. So he says, are you ready? And I said, yes. But he takes, it, takes me through it. Ashadu. And I say, Ashadu. And la, la, ila, ila. And I tell you, with each word, I felt like I had been dying of thirst all those years. And with each word of the Shahada, it felt like somebody was dripping a drop of water into a parched throat. And, uh, and so I became a Muslim. And uh, I walked out of there that day, a Muslim.